think we need to start. We have a very exciting program this morning. Um, and we want to make sure we have enough time. So this week we've seen uh, many great teachers to innovations and achievements from across the world. Uh, and in this session, we'll focus on the foundations that need to be in place to support these great achievements. And in particular on good government, governance processes and strong in-country capacity. And sharing experiences is what this DHS2 conference is all about. And today we've invited five countries with an impressive 62 years of DHS2 experience. And they will share lessons learned from their journey towards a sustainable and country-owned DHS2 implementation. But before we invite these uh, countries to give a short presentation, I will hand it over to give a bit more background on what we mean by the foundations of a DHS2 implementation. So maybe your DHS2 implementation looks a bit like uh, this, with a nice program on top and a bit shaky foundation at the bottom. I hope not for these countries here who have been doing it for a long time. But in the past uh, few months, we have been working very closely within the HISP network to build a framework to understand a little bit more of what makes a DHIS2 uh, system or implementation mature and solid. And if we go to the next slide, you see the boxes here. The foundations at the bottom are the key things that people don't necessarily ask for. They don't necessarily pay for it directly, but it's very important for the system to work well over time. So today in this uh, session and in this uh, uh, the presentations to hear, and we will have a panel uh, conversation afterwards. We will talk about these two things, leadership and governance and building a strong core team in the country. Two things that we know are important for sustainable DHIS2 systems over time. So I will introduce the panel. If you go to the next slide, Ola. We have on stage, we have uh, Maurice Fazou from uh, Cameroon. We have Oswald Bachaga from uh, Ghana. We have Marcelo Amaral from Timor-Leste. We have Brulelo Chubuku from South Africa. And we have Andrew Muhir from Rwanda. And first we will hear some short presentations on how they have tackled these two challenges in their countries before we uh, have them answer some questions together. So welcome. Uh, good morning and uh, thank you for this opportunity. It has given to us to share the, a brief history of health information system reform in Cameroon. <clears throat> we have uh, five rapid points. Uh, first of all, uh, the country presentation, Cameroon is located in Central Africa, closely 28 million uh, inhabitants and uh, 6,200 health facilities. Uh, in 2015, uh, the health information ecosystem what uh, was you were saying there, uh, we uh, witnessed uh, the extension of the of uh, monthly uh, activity report because the system was paper-based and uh, we witnessed an emerging new health information ecosystem made of parallel system. We had uh, 13 parallel system collecting data, autonomous data to 28 different collecting tools. And at that time, uh, the Ministry of Health was not more receiving any data from health facilities. And uh, what were the main causes of that? Uh, in 2000, we had the uh, Millennium developed uh, the Millennium Summit nice. with uh, Millennium Development Goals, a three of which related to health that become subject of uh, international policy. Year 2000, uh, launching of Gavi. Year 2002, uh, launching of the Global Fund. 2003, launching of PEPFA. And 2005, we had uh, the Paris Declaration on Aid Effectiveness. And that global environment were uh, based on the principle of raise money, spend it, and prove it. And data was the oxygen of that new aid ecosystem. 
our paper-based system could not survive in such an environment and we went through a reform with three core principles. First, uh, total uh, digitalization. Second, principle integration. That is the DNA of Cameroon Health, Health Information System. And the third uh, core principle, uh, compliance with uh, the Paris Declaration on Aid Effectiveness, namely ownership, alignment, harmonization, managing for results, mutual accountability. We implemented in uh, many steps. The first step was the selection of uh, GAIS-2 as National Health Information System. November uh, 2015 was the creation of the National uh, Steering Committee in charge of GAIS-2 implementation. And uh, the second step was capacity building of local staff as we wanted the administrator account to permanently remain in Cameroon, it was urgent to rapidly build capacity of local human resources to ensure a total ownership of DAS2 implementing process and to bridge the shortage of specialized human resources. The health information department became a permanent academic internship place for computer science engineers and statistician engineer students. As you can see, uh, our staff were trained in uh, DAS2 academies, mainly with government financing. And uh, you can see here the internship room of our department. Uh, we always have interns from different countries. Here you have uh, interns from Cameroon, Chad, Togo, Democratic Republic of Congo, Burkina Faso. And 80% of uh, GAS2 customization work was done in that room. Uh, the step three was the digitalization of uh, what is called in public health point of interest. So we yeah, went on the field to collect uh, uh, GP coordinate, GPS coordinate of uh, uh, settlements, health facilities, schools, market, churches, and also uh, we collect uh, the GPS coordinate of the boundaries of district health areas that was never done before. And uh, January 2016, uh, Cameroon has his first digitalized health map with uh, five levels, as you can see here, health facility, health area. Uh, that was a new level that we introduced to be closer to uh, the field. And the step four was the harmonization of uh, collecting tools. Uh, January uh, 2016, we organized a workshop, including all programs, and during which uh, 28 autonomous forms were merged into one integrated monthly activity report for each level of health facilities. And the step five was the lab elaboration of uh, a national denominator because each parallel system had, had its own target population or denominator. And none of them had target population of the lower operational unit health area. And we start publishing that national document, uh, January 2017. And then uh, we didn't pilot anything. We rapidly scale up. And uh, we went from uh, conception to scaling up and uh, we have the support of two, two big partners. First, the, the Global Fund who support the training of closely uh, 2000 people and the Islamic Development Bank uh, that support the training of other uh, 2,000 people. So it was an immediate scale up. And uh, we took two years to implement the reform. And in November uh, 2017, the minister signed a circular letter institutionalizing the AIS-2 as National Integrated Health Information System. And they're starting that date was 2018. So after the reform, the ecosystem changed and became this. Uh, 
all the parallel system uh, became technologically obsolete and doomed to extinction like dinosaurs. So, uh, because after the reform, uh, our system was technologically uh, most performant than all parallel system. And the lesson behind this is that people easily line up behind success, not uh, behind authority. Uh, the, here are the main uh, reason why um, parallel system definitely migrated into the national instance. Uh, the Health Information Unit of the Ministry of Public Health adopted a technological monopoly and abstained to follow many recommend good practice, even from Oslo University. We abstain to share shape file with parallel system and new actors, many unhappy partners. We abstain also to create a master facility list, not necessary when the system is integrated, many unhappy partners. Abstention to share the health area operational level, no existing in any parallel system architecture. Abstention to share administrator account with any external technical assistance, many unhappy partners. Obligation uh, for all new application promoters to prove that DAIS2 can't do the job the application are supposed to do. Many, many unhappy uh, partners. <laughs> <laughs> so this is an example of transition from uh, a parallel system to uh, national system, and this is the example of immunization program. Uh, before the reform, they were using DV, DMT, and then uh, uh, their data element was were customized in the national inst instance, and as from 2018, they were using the two system, uh, DV, DMT, and DAIS2, and as from 2019, they uh, they, they, they made a total transition to the national instance. And that uh, was globally the internship workforce helpers for importation of uh, program historical data from previous application to uh, national DIS2. Uh, this is the Cape of Performance Indicator of our unit um, before and after uh, the reform. Before the reform, uh, 2015, 0% of data were sent to our, our unit, 0%. And after the reform to this year, 2022, uh, the completeness of report is always above, above 94%. And, <laughs> and this concern all the health facility in the country, public, private, uh, denominational, Everything is integrated. And the data here are all the data. And after that, after the integration, integration has its, un, uh, its problem because although the system was integrated, a parallel dashboard flourish created by programs, some public order heading, it was difficult for decision makers at district, regional and national levels to visit that landscape of isolated dashboard. So, we customize a national integrated dashboard, uh, including uh, priority diseases, neglect diseases, and even forgotten diseases. So everything is there when you go through that national dashboard, you will see all the country, all the health system in the country. And <clears throat> this is a brief overview of that uh, integrated dashboard. You can have malaria, hypertension, sickle cell disease, road accidents, and so forth. Then we uh, went uh, for community health and the approach was the same, uh, integration. So we elaborated <clears throat> an integrated uh, monthly activity report for all activity, all um, community activity. We have only one document that you can see here. <clears throat> it was also customized in the system. And we also customized an integrated dashboard to monitor all community uh, health activities. And 
here you can see the land listing of community health workers and all their activities and so on. So um, they did an assessment recently uh, with the support of the, the, the uh, Oslo University. The assessment was done using the tool developed by the University of Oslo in line with uh, the DAI's two maturity framework and with an overall wage proportion of 61%. So Cameroon GAIS2 profile reached an appreciation of adequate, although we didn't follow all good practices, you know. <laughs> so uh, the next step, uh, we are launching next month, July, uh, the track uh, for case-based management of tuberculosis, 280 dinos in treatment centers. That uh, is fully customized by local staff, uh, the Minister of uh, Public Health. Uh, 208 thumb books were purchased, two years budget secure and training. We start uh, next month, July. So to conclude, uh, EAIS2, a digital public good, appear as the most appropriate solution for health informants system reform in Cameroon driven by ownership and philosophy of uh, technology, the service of public health, and not the other way around. Thank you very much. Thank you. So my name is Oswald Dachaga, uh, Health Information Systems Manager with the Ghana Health Service. I think uh, it's a good time to be here at this conference. The fact that Ghana have been with DHIS for the past 10 years, and it is a great milestone to be doing this presentation. Uh, as we all would already know, the Ghana Health Service is the biggest agency within the ministry in Ghana, uh, charged with implementing the policies of the ministry and have the bigger responsibility of uh, collecting data for all public health facilities and other uh, institutional facilities that exist in the country. We currently run a national aggregate system that is running on DHIS. We also have programmatic implementations of tracker that is running the entire country, which is a subject in 2018. And then we also have maternal and child health implementations in some regions that has been ongoing. One of the key things that we have been able to do and do well have been to build on existing systems. Before the arrival of DHIS2 in Ghana, we were running an access-based HMIS system. And so uh, upon introduction of DHIS to us, it was uh, quite easier to adapt uh, DHIS to build on the gains that we had chalked as far as the HMIS system is concerned. And this is uh, a very important to have, uh, that you already have an existing HMIS system that you are then using the technology to strengthen, and that's key. The Center for Health Information, and that is uh, charged with the responsibility of implementing HMI solutions in Ghana had a very pivotal role in this whole process. And in 2012, we had a very strong collaboration between the Ghana Health Service and the University of Oslo uh, to adapt DHIS platform as our uh, generic platform for HMIS in Ghana. How have we been able to do it for 10 years? It's all was built around in house capacity. And the very first statement in the MOU then between the Ghana Health Service and the University of Oslo was the fact that if you can't teach us to do it ourselves, then we are not interested. And so we started with building a very core team that were staff of the Ghana Health Service that started the customized that there was also the identification of key officers from the various regions that formed as a second layer of uh, exposure 
for us to be able to have some technical capabilities in the regions to be able to support programs to buy in the idea of integration and getting all the data from one source. And one key thing that also worked for us was the fact that we had a senior manager who was fronted as a champion of the system. And so he was able to do the engagement with other senior managers to be able to buy the idea of running a DHIS too. Then we had a lot of standardization. We developed an SOP for health information management. And then we also have the ministry having a health information strategy that then governs however, how we want to run DHIS and our HMIS system in the country. Challenges with uh, sustaining the gains. Uh, one, you need to be able to gain the trust of the various stakeholders involved. You need to have local support system initiatives that is very critical. And then the managerial uh, commitments at all levels becomes a very pivotal thing. And if you are not able to deal with that, then it is difficult to sustain the gains that you have made over the years. What has been our key lessons? We need to engage, engage, and engage. You need to stop, not to stop communicating because that is the only way you get people to understand what the vision and the idea is. And of course, using DHIS2 as uh, the main platform performance reviews then makes everybody interested in getting the quality improved on the system so that we are able to improve the general performance of the healthcare system. Thank you. Thank you very much uh, for opportunity. So, the more or less that to present uh, some issue related to the le leadership and capacity development regarding to implementation of uh, district health information system too in Timor Leste. Next. Thank you. Okay, okay this is the history of uh, uh, implementation of uh, DHSS 2 in Timor Leste. Before 2013, we just using uh, Excel uh, uh, Excel to uh, manage our information. I think this is a very, uh, what we call it, a simple uh, uh, system that we use. But uh, we thank you for uh, WHO that uh, introducing the uh, district health information system to, to Timor Leste to help us to better manage our uh, uh, health information system. So we have started implementing in 2013 uh, and uh, up to 2017, we fully adapted into the uh, Timor Leste health information system. So uh, all the 13 district that we have uh, implement uh, uh, the 
uh, what we call it, uh, Timor Leste Health Information System using District Health Information System too. So in 2020, we conduct first national uh, review for Timor Leste Health Information System. And um, I think this is uh, uh, one of the first review that uh, Dr. Asala was there, uh, is uh, supporting us to conduct this review. And now um, 2021, we start to use it for immunization, uh, COVID-19 immunization track tracking, and also a uh, point of entry, uh, uh, more related to the uh, prevention and mitigation uh, COVID-19. And uh, also in 2022, recently, we uh, upgraded into the version uh, 2.36. Uh, so uh, also we are doing the, the review on uh, maternal and child health uh, modules so far. Next, sorry. Okay, this is data, data flow that we have. To, uh, we have only uh, 70 uh, uh, community health centers uh, that the data flow from the each programs in a community health center, in health post, and also uh, we call it the uh, Saudina Familia uh, and SISCA. Uh, uh, SISCA is an uh, integrated uh, community health service in the community, uh, integrated uh, health services in the community. Uh, and we also uh, get uh, data from uh, private clinics and uh, will be consolidated in uh, 13 uh, health uh, municipal uh, office. And uh, from the national, it's uh, managed by uh, health management information system department. So all referral hospitals and national hospitals, they submit their report uh, to the each uh, uh, each municipio, each uh, municipal that uh, that hospital located. This is data collection form that we have. Uh, I think we uh, we need some revision of this data collection, uh, especially for the human resource uh, that number twenty one, the human resources. Now uh, WHO helping us to. Uh, uh, look at in the separate uh, uh, system, and uh, we hope that it will be uh, uh, connected to the uh, uh, district health information system of the uh, Timor Leste health information system. Uh, other uh, format that we are working now is uh, uh, for logistic management information system, current M supply. Uh, to track all the uh, uh, pharmaceutical management, and uh, we uh, we will uh, we, we are still working on in these uh, modules, and we hope that it will be integrated into the uh, district health management information system. And the, this is the status of the implementation uh, in Timor Leste. We implement in all districts uh, uh, with over 400 users. Data entry mostly done by community health center level uh, with the trained and dedicated health information system officer. Uh, we continue with the refreshing training uh, to upgrade uh, the skills of the, our users and also uh, the server that managed by uh, ICT department of Minister of Health. And now we working with uh, IT agency, IT national agency, in order to uh, also uh, uh, how to integrate it to the government uh, IC, ICT uh, uh, system. We also upgrade in hosting services to accommodate the increasing number of the user. Um, I think this is something that we need to uh, evaluate uh, annually. Uh, in order to uh, keep the performance of the system uh, going on. Um, in May 2022, as I mentioned before, uh, District Health Information System 2 is uh, uh, updated. And uh, all of this uh, system managed by uh, 
uh, Health Management Information System Department uh, Minister of Health with support from WHO uh, country office. Leadership and uh, governance uh, challenges that we have. The, uh, uh, the weak commitment of municipal health management team is the one of the issue because uh, the more or less that we are applying decentralization to the municipal, all the district health management team appointed by uh, municipal administrator. Uh, this is uh, have the command uh, command line uh, under Minister of State Administration. So this is one thing that uh, uh, one of the challenges that we need to 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 sort out. Integration with the laboratory and hospital information system. This need to be also uh, work on in order to uh, to harmonize with the. Uh, the has uh, to uh, system um the human resource and it infra infrastructure is is one of uh, uh, some of the uh, the area that become a challenging um so uh, we need to give more attention uh, to that uh, area um Governance manual is still in development process and need uh, sometimes for adapt uh, adaptation and uh, refreshing training. Uh, this is very important uh, because uh, without uh, proper uh, governance manuals, uh, the institutionalization it will become uh, an issue. So uh, when we the last two days we just discussed about the uh, government commitment. Uh, how the functionality is working. Uh, the more important thing is uh, uh, if we want to maintain functionality of the uh, health information system in the country, we need to have the proper uh, government uh, uh, tools and government structure in place. Uh, so I think this is one of the issues that we are need to, to address. Uh, governance structure and function each level health services need to be strengthened. Uh, uh, what does mean uh, uh, all the structure in the, from the national uh, to the uh, municipal and community health center level, including the hospital, they need to aware that uh, the health information system is is very important as the part of the. Uh, the integration of the health system approach or health system thinking. Uh, so this is something that we need to address as well. What is the, uh, we need to do next? Leadership and governance. We need, we developed the national policy and digital health system roadmap. This is, a, thank you. Uh, established national health, Health Management Information Information System Advisory Committee and a Technical Working Group, including uh, Human Resource Management Information System uh, procedure into the interministerial contract between Minister of Health and Minister of State Administration, establish a memorandum of understanding between MOH and a national IT agency, uh, develop all government manuals and needed needed including conduct regular data, data quality assessment and uh, uh, DHS uh, maturity assessment, develop framework and a standard for exchange integration, sharing uh, ret retrieval of electronic health information system, training and capacity assessment, conduct uh, health management information system functional analysis at all level. This is very important uh, in order to uh, have institution institutionalization. Uh, without proper functional analysis, it will be also one of the problem. Review and a standardized term of reference of uh, health management information system staff, including ICT staff. Conduct skill gaps analysis and training need analysis for development short and long-term capacity development plan. Institutionalize uh, health management information system training program at National Health Institute and including information system management into the performance management criteria for all health manager. I think this is uh, uh, all my presentation and thank you very much for time attention. Uh, program director, 
Uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, good morning. I'm greatly honored to be part of the DHIS2 community this morning to share the South African experience in the implementation of, of DHIS. Uh, my name is Mbulelo Kabubo. I'm the Director for National Health Information System in South Africa. I'm here with uh, Mrs. Uh, uh, Milan Polmarans, who is the Chief Director for National Health Information Systems uh, for, for, for National Health Information uh, Systems in South Africa. And I'm also together with a very big team from uh, his, his South Africa, who are also amongst us. Uh, amongst us, we also have a Norwegian South African, a color who is sort of sitting far from the team, but is also part of us. I think we have adopt, adopted him uh, many years ago. Um, as countries have already presented here, I think South Africa has got more than two decades uh, of DHIS implementation. As you can see with this small note that we have attached, we have attached an evidence to show that the, the first contract on DHIS implementation in South Africa was signed as far back as 1994, the year that South Africa attained its uh, uh, democracy as we had our first uh, democratic elections in 1994, this contract had just uh, been a month uh, signed. So therefore the, the building of DHIS was led by a, a very small team with Kale as one of the, the lead uh, pioneers for DHIS in South Africa uh, with uh, funding for, from NORAD. Uh, the Norwegian government uh, played a very big role in this uh, uh, undertaking. But in terms of the implementation of South African uh, DHIS, I think it's important for us to just perhaps provide a, a bit of an understanding that South Africa is quite a, a very big country with an estimated uh, 60.1 uh, million people uh, in terms of the 2021 media population estimates. And we've got nine uh, provinces. Uh, and in terms of then the implementation of any system, uh, including DHIS, therefore in the country, it relies upon a very strong legislative uh, framework. Uh, we've got the National Health Act, which was uh, promulgated in 1994, uh, more or less the same time as we started with the DHIS. And in terms of section uh, 74 of that act, it then uh, gives the, the minister uh, the powers to determine uh, the, the coordination of the national health information systems. And also then also to be able to prescribe the terms of data that can be uh, reported. And in terms of the, the major push that the country is going towards is the, the, uh, the move towards universal health coverage. And within that, the legislative framework that we are currently finalizing is the National Health Insurance um, Bill, which is before cabinet now for, for approval. But in terms of the implementation of the entire health information systems, in 2012, there was an e-health strategy that was uh, developed, uh, which then included the direction for the disease health information system in the country. And also then that was reviewed in 2017, which resulted in the country then in, in line with the WHO adopting a national digital health strategy for South Africa. And uh, we also, in terms of uh, the standards, the country has also then uh, uh, developed a, a national health normative standards framework, which then uh, guide the country in terms of the various health standards that should be adopted. And this, the first publication of this uh, health normative standards framework was in 2014. And in 2020, then we reviewed uh, these uh, so that they are more implementable. So we are in the path because the technology changes very fast and also the standards have to keep up. With regards to governance, um, as far back as 1996, the then Director General um, realized that it was quite imperative that 
there is an overarching policy framework. Uh, hence, then the development of the digital health management information systems uh, policy was established. And this policy therefore uh, gave the different roles to the, the various players in the, in the system because we've got uh, provinces, we've got the uh, National uh, Director General who has got the overall uh, responsibility on the health information system, but we also have the heads of health in each province. So therefore this policy then uh, determines the various roles that they have and the powers, but it also talks to the uh, ownership of the data. It talks to the issues of privacy and security and as you know that in the research community, we, we have a lot of stakeholders who have got an interest in, in the data. We also have the national treasury that also uses this data. So therefore it determines therefore the requirements for the integrity of the data that we use. We also have then the standard operating procedures. And then for the various levels of care, we've got the facility level SOPs, we've got the district level SOPs, provincial level as well as the national SOPs to ensure that the implementation at an operational level is guided in line with the policy. We also have the very important uh, uh, national data dictionary then that guides the, the common uh, uh, use then of the DHIS in terms of the definitions that were used. And we also have the national indicator uh, data set that every two years gets revised as it, it, was, as it was presented yesterday. So we have got these uh, governance mechanisms that assist us. We also have got the master facility list, which is quite huge, which has got all our facilities, both public and private. And we've also included now the, the vaccination sites, some of which are non-health uh, sites that are part of the uh, master facility list for, for the country. In terms of the DHIS uh, to implementation, uh, our transition uh, to DHIS 2 as we started, we started in 2016 from the MS uh, access. From 2016, uh, we started then the path of, of transitioning to the DHIS 2. But in terms of the daily data capturing, the country uh, at the moment, by the end of March, when we are reporting for our annual report at the end of the 2021-22 financial year, we were at 77% uh, implementation in terms of daily data capturing. But at the primary healthcare level, we are at 74%. And uh, hospitals there were almost at 100%. The reason uh, between the hospital and, and clinics is the issues of connectivity that not all our, our clinics are, are connected, which then uh, limits our ability to move fast in terms, of, in terms of the daily data capturing. But with regards to then the uh, aggregation of data from the nine provincial instances to the national instance, currently we are at uh, over 12 million uh, records per, per month. And, um, also, in terms of the DHIS implementation, there are also non-standardized DHIS2 use cases. For instance, we use DHIS2 as a platform for the allocation of intensive and community service uh, position for our newly qualified professionals, such as uh, our, our young doctors. We also have using the, the platform also for the human resource information systems as well as also for the malaria, for the integrated uh, disease surveillance and response. And also for one of the biggest, I think, uh, mHealth implementations uh, that has been done to scale, uh, which we call the Mom Connect, which then looks after the, the pregnant mothers and uh, gives them uh, uh, messages that are specific to their various stages uh, as, as they, uh, of their pregnancy. Then with regards to capacity building, uh, earlier on capacity building was realized as very key in terms of our move as a country to ensure that we can then fully implement uh, a DHIS. We started with the um, data capturers, uh, which we then uh, absorbed those people. We started with more than 3000 data capturers, but we also realized that for each level of care, we need to ensure that there's strong capacity. 
So, but we use then an, an approach of uh, train the trainer because we realize that it's important that our partner, his SA, just trains uh, these trainers so that then they can focus on more innovative uh, work on, on the DHIS2 than to, to maintain the training and the capacity building. So we have a very organized uh, online and also in-person uh, training program for various levels. But we also have another training that is focused on, on our experts who have to ensure that at the technical level, they can also then ensure that they are gradually taking over some of the, uh, the uh, or technical aspects of, uh, of, the, of the management of the, of the various instances at provincial level. So I will uh, end there. Thanks. Thank you, Mr. Vanda. Uh, thank you. I'm uh, Andrew Mohir from Rwanda. I'm happy to be here. So my presentation will be really looking at the Rwanda experience around DHS experience, um, implementation. So before I start, I just wanted to give you a quick, my story, my first day in Oslo. When I came in Oslo the first day, I didn't read really how I would move from Oslo city to my hotel. Everyone is attentive now. <laughs> okay. So when I went out of, from Oslo City, I didn't know. The only thing I knew was just the name of the hotel. Then I just walked. Then by chance, I was, I just, when I was walking, I just saw Thorn Hotel somewhere. Then I went in, I said, Andrew, yes, 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 yes. Then by chance, I was at the hotel. Then was the one, when I was in my room, I just said, oh my goodness, I'm, I'm, I managed to make it. But it was by chance. The lesson here, you cannot implement DHS2 by chance. <laughs> so everything you need to invest, the only investment that I did from Oslo City to hotel was just walking. But in DHS2, you have to invest in many things. You have to invest in capacity building, you have to invest in, uh, in servers, you have to invest in what I'm going to, to present here. Okay, thank you for your attention. So um, I was seeing everyone was busy. So actually, um, um, like many other countries that presented, we, we also had this pressure in Rwanda where we wanted to have a system that is able to integrate uh, the data from all his facilities, public and private. Uh, then but because of that pressure, we managed to come up with different options. In 2000, we tried to come up with access-based system that we thought that is going to, to solve our problems, but unfortunately it was not really meeting the requirement. Then in 2007, after seven years, we also had another pressure that what we have implemented is not really responding to the needs and the, the needs from the programs and is not really uh, improving the data quality and reporting rate. Then we also changed the system to SQL based. And here we thought that we have solved this, uh, the problem from programs, but unfortunately it was not the better solution. Then there was again the pressure to have another system that is really web-based that is able to collect all data and integrate everything into one, which was the like a data repository. So in 2010, we started the process. Uh, that's why I was telling you that you need to invest. We started the process of harmonizing all reporting forms to ensure that they are all harmonized, integrated uh, to avoid vertical reportings uh, before even acquiring a system. Because most of the time we find we just go for the system before we even harmonize the registers and reporting forms. So that exercise brought together all partners, programs to discuss which are indicators. The main criteria was that the indicator to accommodate into our reporting form was supposed to be in any strategy, policy, global commitments, and others. So with that exercise, with all those criteria, we managed to reduce our reporting form from 45 pages to 12 pages, when it was integrated with all programs. Then in 2012, we launched DHS2 when at least everything down, the processes and other things are well harmonized. Then later we started developing all documents that, that are needed in terms of indicator reference manual to ensure that we are, you are defining indicator the same way. SOPs, standard operating procedures to ensure that uh, all processes are really defined. If there's any meeting that is required for data, collect, data collection timeline, everything is well defined. The role and responsibility of every person. Then in 20, 
two, we are ready to initiate different innovation on top of DHS2. So you can see this photo. I don't know if you are able to recognize me. This was 2011. I keep walking. I was walking to the academy, the first academy that we conducted in Darisam, Tanzania. I was with my colleague Adolf, who was trusting me, but he didn't know that I reached there by chance. <laughs> so you can see my colleague, another person was just taking our pictures. So we are heading to that academy, this side. This was the first academy. By that time, it was two weeks academy. There was no any packages and whatever. The only package I remember was just grabbing everything in your head. Then the reason why I brought this picture is that when we left Rwanda, the head of HMI's department, because I became the head of department in 2013, by that time we had another one. The head of department told us that you are going, but you have to come and do those things and you have to work. So you can see how we are really, we are thinking how we're going to grab everything. So on this side, uh, Ola, you will allow me to say it. You can see Ola and Lash and other guys, they are busy. You, see, you are seeing them. I don't know if you're able to see them. That time there were no materials. Nick, there was no material. They were working on materials and they come and present, they work on the material, they were ready. <laughs> They had pressure there. So it was really a good experience because it was an intensive one, but that was the best academy that I attended because we had to do exams. It was like academic ones. So we had to do, uh, you can see on, on the back of, you can see at the back of all of this, Adolf. Adolf was checking if we can get all of at least five minutes to ensure that the tracker is well known and something like that. Because we knew that when we go back at home, we will not have the global teams to work with us. So it was really tough. Um, then, what were the key drivers to lead to this implementation? Of course, from those all other pictures that I, show, I was showing, the first thing is always support from the leadership. Uh, we had good support from the leadership. I remember one time when I was in the senior management meeting, I was lucky that I was attending these senior management meetings. Uh, the minister told all program managers that I will not allow any other presentation without statistics. And again, I will not allow any source of data when you're not putting down HMIs. Then the, he, she instructed me to be presenting weekly the progress of integration from programs. So you can imagine the lineup of programs coming to me, checking if we have integrated for the next meeting. And when you have a chance of that meeting, you always call a spoon a spoon. You don't go there and say they are working, it's working. No, you just say, Three of them have integrated, but these other ones have not integrated. They can explain to us. <laughs> then next time you can see everyone integrating. So leadership is key. Then capacity building, of course, when you are really creating that kind of demand, you have to ensure that you have a team that are able to support all demands for the programs. IT infrastructure, we're lucky that the government invested much more in infrastructure to ensure that at least we have that layer. Because you, know, you cannot implement this solution when you don't have computers and other stuff. Then SOP, as I said, standard operating procedure is very important because the reason why you can see me presenting here is because you have people there that have organized it. We have agenda that tells us we have to come to this meeting. So imagine when we implement all these solutions, then we just drop them to the health facility without defining what is the role of the nurse, what is the role of data manager, what is the role of the head of this facility. Then when it comes to, to accountability, you find them blaming each other. I remember in 2013, we had a low rate of reporting in system. Then we just did the investigation on some facilities that were not reporting. Do you know what we found? It was only role and responsibility. They didn't know who does what, when. That's when we strengthened the use of this standard operating procedure to ensure that when someone didn't report, you know that you're asking Andrew. If Andrew didn't report, he can even be able to tell you what are other details. So SOP is very important. Then these are things that SOP defines when it comes to data management and data collection to ensure that the reporting rate is really at a high level. So this is an example of what we put in the reporting on this SOP. It's like on a monthly basis, you have to conduct data, data uh, check meeting, which is data, we call it data, there's data management meeting, but there's also the, the meetings that I do when they are checking the data. You can see these are the pictures that are there, down there and up there. This is how they do this meeting on monthly basis to ensure that all data they are reporting is really validated by the head of, of NAS. So that validation means accountability goes to the head of NAS to ensure that whatever they reported represented related, related, 
the reality from the facilities. Okay, so you can understand because you, you know, these meetings have to, you have to define it in your SOP that the meeting have, have to happen on weekly, on monthly basis. It have to be chaired by this person. Uh, the timeline of reporting is this time. The timeline of checking data is this time. Just all of these have to be in your SOPs. So again, here you can ask yourself, what motivates programs to join you or to bring their data in, in DHS2? There are many things that you have to ensure that people, first of all, is that you have to have a strong internal capacity team that are able to support because you, someone can only trust you when you have skills than him. But when, you know, these program teams, most of the time they attend different trainings, you find they are really very good people. So you have to have a stronger team to ensure that they are able to support them. Another one is data quality improvement. They have to see that there's improvements in the data for other programs, so that when they are talking to other programs, they, they tell them that, oh, for us, the reporting rate have increased. We are using these different features and others. Then ownership. Uh, this was the training in terms of capacity building. This was the training that we hosted in Rwanda. Uh, it was also two weeks. You can even read the first one. The, the Minister of Health, Dr. Agnes Mnagawa, has launched the two week academy, but this time I don't think we are conducting two weeks. That time it was two weeks. So without taking long, I think the lesson learned from, from our implementation is that uh, leadership is key, governance and coordination, which is even part of the leadership, infrastructure, capacity building to ensure that you have a pool of experts. I remember we used to, uh, to, to send many of people to attend these academies and uh, uh, having these academies in Rwanda to ensure that at least we have program people trained. At the end of the day, when you have program people, when you have experts in the programs, they are the, you find that they are the ones supporting you when it comes to implementation of this IT solution. So uh, this is the examples of how we do things. The academies, we share experience. I was in one of the poster in outside yesterday, last, last day. Then I was in one poster when someone was explaining how they are reviewing their reporting form. Then he told me, you know, the way we are doing it is that thing that you presented in Rwanda. They came for the study visit. Then I presented, I didn't, do, I didn't know that these stories that we present are making impact on the other side. So he was presenting exactly the same process, which was really very good because if you are learning from each other, it's good. So people that just say, we are, I love DHS2, always love what you're doing. It will be successful. Thank you. Okay, thank you so much to, my mic is on, right? Yeah. Uh, thank you so much to all the presenters. I think it was very interesting to hear your takes on what it takes to, to get where you are. So with your 62 years of uh, good experience with DHIS2, I guess there are also some fresh new countries here in the audience. Are there any one advice you would give to a new country starting up? Anybody yeah. want to answer? Uh, thank you. I would Return. perhaps uh, advise as follows. I think the first slide that was uh, showing the foundations, I think is quite key that you establish your leadership, your governance, as well as also ensure that we have got the core team that will, will then uh, assist you to implement DHIS2. But I think uh, over and above that, we ensure that then you bring all the st stakeholders on board, because as you saw that that was a house that had that strong foundation, but we have to ensure that everybody feels that they are part of the process of the JHIS2 implementation, then I think that way then you will succeed. Thank you. Do you have a good advice? Okay, uh, as advice, I could say, uh, make sure that you are setting up something that's better than everything existing in the country at that time. <laughs> if not just, uh, you know, align on what is existing, <laughs> we cannot do better. Anybody else would like to give a good advice to new countries? Andrew? Uh, actually, for me, I always emphasize on... Um, uh, bringing pattern together, 
then you have like a, a coordinated invest in investment towards HMIs, that's one. Secondly, ensure that you discourage vertical systems because most of the time when you have scattered efforts, you always fail. So um, vertical system means you have to sit down and come up with the integrated reporting system that really re responds to the needs from all, all, all stakeholders and partners. That in that way, you will just converge all your efforts together and it will lead to success. Thank you. I also have a question for uh, Ghana because you've been uh, building your core team for many, many years. And I think it was interesting how you explained how you have moved from the district and up to the national level. But maybe it's not always a smooth road. The, you, you talk about the nice things here, but if maybe something has been bumpy. Like if you could start over again, is there anything you would have done differently? Thank you. So uh, definitely, if we had the opportunity to start again, uh, two key things that we might want to do and do better. One has to do with ownership data and the systems that we have built. Uh, we draw lessons from how our HIV tracker is currently performing because uh, we've had real ownership of that system where people within the program are the ones running it. And then we just, as a country technical team, provide technical support to them. We do not have that much success with maternal and child health. And it all comes down to how well we have been able to implement this issue of ownership and getting the program people to lead the process. And then we just supply and give them the technical support. So given an opportunity, it is one thing we will want to really do well. The other key thing that we would wish uh, we do well has to do with adopting new features on the releases from the core, DHIS core. We had a quite an experience uh, with a tracker implementation in 2018, where we had a drastic move from the initial design of the Android app to the new one. And the key lesson in there was that when you start a process, you need to firm up with the users. Let them get familiar with what you have introduced before you adopt the new features. Otherwise, you are going to throw them off board and then it discourages them and it becomes very difficult to then get them to follow what you are doing. So the new features are good. They come handy. It's so flashy, but you need to hasten slowly, set up a migration process properly, and then you can transit in uses gradually onto the new features that are coming in and you'll be able to sustain your system. So I have a question for everyone. <laughs> Is this on now? Yeah, yes, yes. perfect. Andrew, you talked about how you managed to get all the programs on board. And now your system is growing quickly. How do you manage all this demand for expansion from all the health programs? How do you keep up? Yeah, um, that's a good question. Actually, our initial investment was uh, always on capacity building. And we uh, our capacity building was towards having a pool of experts, not only in HMIs, but also inside the programs. So uh, we've been hosting different academies with that aim to have many people attending. We've been sending people in academies outside to, to also have them uh, trained on different uh, customization of the HIS and others. So during uh, that huge demand that we are pushing uh, to have everything integrated, so we've been using people from programs. They became our resources to use. Then when we are like customizing tracker for malaria, we bring people from HIV, malaria, and others, then we sit down. You can understand that you can even do like three to four trackers because the resource people were there and, and we are able to use them to come up with something. But again, another thing that we did was having the implementation, the, the, the budget to support trainings that was cross-cutting. So in a way that uh, that joint budget, in case we have anything new, we just use the same budget to train people for the, for the new modules. That is how we did it in Rwanda, but I will be happy to hear from the rest of the teams if they have, and otherwise they did it. Thank you. Thank you, Andrew. 
Let me pass it over to Dr. Fesser. So I have a question for Cameroon. Um, many ministers of health are under con constant pressure from partners, both inside and outside the country, to implement new technologies and new systems. How do you manage this pressure in a coordinated way? Oh, okay, thank you <clears throat> for that very important question. Uh, we have a SOP for partner management. <laughs> with a checklist of questions. When you bring a new application, the first question on the checklist is, is it open source or patented? Patent. Okay. If it's open source, it's go. If it's patented, no go. The second question, if it's open source, what is the added value of your application compared to district health information software? And sometimes, majority of time, people cannot really explain what is the added value. But if it's possible to explain the added value, yes, it's go. If you cannot explain, it's no go. And the third question, if uh, you can show the added value, the third question is, do you have budget to scale up because we are not implementing pilot things in cap? Anyway, where I am, we are not implementing pilots. We are not a research institute. We are a minister of public health. We are guided by the general interest, by equity. So when something is good, it's good for everybody, for all people in the country. It's not just good for two districts or three. So do you have money to scale up, budget to scale up the application? Do you have budget to train people, to sustain it? Is is not, we stop there. So it's very clear procedure. And sometimes I just get feedback from the minister. He's telling me, you are the most unpopular man in this ministry. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so if I could just add a little, I think one of the things that can help uh, with all these partners and people introducing new system is the fact that you, you need to have a national HMI strategy. It's key. You need to know what you want as a country even before the partners come in. Otherwise, they will throw you off board. And then one other thing has to do with uh, interoperability is good, but if you do not have a strategy, it can then also be exploited because uh, at the start of the implementation of DHIS, you harmonize all these uh, hard copy tools to get an uh, integrated system. Then people come and the next thing they are asking is that, but you say DHIS is interoperable. So why don't you allow me to install, uh, set up a new solution for A or B and then integrate onto your national uh, system. And if you do not manage that process very well, you will find out that yes, you have been able to harmonize the paper-based tools along the years, then you then have multiple systems that are all asking for integrations into the national HMI system. And that can also be a very difficult process to manage if you do not have the capacity for all those systems, even though the system may be interoperable. Thank you. Thank you. I think the next question is going to uh, South Africa. You uh, talked about these strong governance committees that you have in South Africa, uh, especially this NISA governance committee. Could you elaborate a little bit more on why that is important for DHIS2 and especially with this goal of reaching universal health care in South Africa? Uh, thank you, Anne, for, for that question. Um, the National Health Information Systems Committee of South Africa, it's a, a technical uh, committee that reports to the uh, subcommittee of the National Health Council. So the that committee that it reports to, it's a committee that is chaired by the Director General with the, the nine provincial heads of health. So therefore, the NISA as a committee, it's a committee that is able then to make technical recommendations to the decision makers uh, for DHIS implementation, as well as the overall uh, strategy. 
as well as the reforms that the current leaders are taking, for instance, the implementation of the national health uh, insurance as part of the uh, attainment of the uh, universal health coverage. So therefore, the that committee therefore has got people who implement on the ground. So they are able then to take then the decisions that are coming from the technical committee of the National Health Council, take them down to the provinces, to the districts, as well as the facility for the actual implementation. Because these various uh, levels are very key for the implementation of the national health insurance. So therefore that uh, link between the NISA committee and that uh, committee of decision makers is, is very key for us for successful implementation of uh, DHIS2 as well as the overall uh, reform of our health system towards the universal health coverage. Thank you. Thank you. So we have one more question for Timor Lester, but before we before I ask that question, we, we have time for some questions from the audience. So think about any question you'd like to ask and we'll get back to that in a few minutes. So for Timor Leste, we understand that you have um, a close working relationship with HISP uh, Sri Lanka and that you've together achieved great things during the COVID pandemic. Can you say a little bit more about the longer term plan now for building that in-house expertise? Uh, thank you very much. Uh, as uh, I mentioned before that uh, uh, without proper institutionalization and uh, uh, the functional analysis, and uh, it will be also the capacity development will be fragmented. So what I mentioned uh, before that we need to have something more systematic that uh, come out with the proper long-term capacity development plan. And uh, cooperation with Sri Lanka is the uh, one of the uh, good models. Uh, we call it twinning arrangement. Uh, but the twinning arrangement uh, need to be also adjusted with this uh, long-term capacity building developments in order to build uh, in-country capacity. Uh, if we are not really careful on this uh, process, uh, our uh, my worries is uh, we will build the individual capacity, but not build the institutional capacity in order to sustain uh, the district health information system uh, to implementation in the country. But we are lucky because uh, in the previous we don't have any system in place, so uh, the district health information system too is the uh, uh, currently this is the only uh, only option that we use in order to improve our health information system in the country. And uh, of, sure the, uh, of course, that the cooperation with the uh, Sri Lankan uh, government, Minister of Health, we are still uh, uh, need, and uh, how we uh, will be assist Timor Leste to build our in-country capacity. Thank you very much. Thank you, thank you. So we, we have time for the questions from the audience. I think we let's prioritize these guys before the Zoom uh, cloud. Hands up, yeah. Uh, thank you. Uh, my name is Abdurrahman I'm from UNICEF Somalia. I am Abdurrahman from UNICEF Somalia. Just a quick question. We, I agree everyone here is uh, labeling himself or herself uh, leeches to community member. So it seems like uh, people who have been implementing a decade ago, leeches to are facing the same challenge uh, the newcomers are facing. And for my understanding, when we say community, it means we need to help each other and uh, maybe learn how to work. So this, some of the problems are generic. What is the Oslo University or the core team for DHS is still doing so that we don't have to be repeating this saying, we have this, we have that, that have been said 10 years ago. So what, what is the Oslo University doing about that? Cool. And then the second question, what are the resources available for uh, countries that are starting DHS2 now so that they don't face the same challenge? What are the plans? How do you distribute the resources? Thank you. So I was hoping you were asking them a question. <laughs> 
I mean, to answer you very short, we could say that, you know, we're doing this. I mean, these guys know how to do it. And I think by allowing you to listen to them and share these ideas, I think that's a very important first step. Uh, we also organize a lot of academies. Andrew just told about, you know, that first academy in 2011, where Andrew, Venusta and, and Adolf worked very late every night, working very hard to go back to, to their bosses in the ministry and show what they had learned and started implementing. And I think that's a, but it's a journey. Huh? I think uh, there's no shortcut to do this in, in six months or one year. You have to work very hard over many years. Um, I hope that through some of these sessions this week, with uh, implementation guidance and discussions, you know, you are learning a bit how to do it, but we also have a lot of resources, of course, online and in the more formal academy programs, training programs, where we go through these topics. But I really want these guys to be asked questions now, so let's move over there, yeah. Hi, thanks for the presentation. I'm Rose from Chai. And I know many programs had mentioned that uh, there was tying performance to the reporting rate to help make sure everyone is doing what they're supposed to do and then making sure the system is working well. So a question that I had was, um, are there other metrics and measures of success that programs are able to track to help make that case for future investment? I'm wondering about if you've observed cost savings, time and staff, uh, staff hours saved, access to care, any of those kind of metrics that are able to be linked back to this investment in DHIS2? Okay, thank you. So um, with regards to issue of cost saving and uh, implementation strategies, I think one of the gaps we've had is that uh, the support countries have had with DHIS uh, implementation have largely been programmatic. So you don't have a lot of partners uh, supporting the core teams when it comes to the generic HMI solution, but that is really the hope around which all the other programs need to rely on to be able to perform uh, functionally. So one cost saving mechanism that could be very beneficial to all of us is where there is targeted uh, funding to the HMIS team, then whatever capacity and implementation strategies are inbuilt with the core team can then flow across all programs so that you don't have a situation where in a country where malaria is having enough funding, everybody's talking of malaria, then malaria is doing well, and then HIV is struggling. Three years, four years down the line, you have to go through the same cycle with another program, and that becomes a lot more expensive to do. So we should have some coordinated way of getting this core HMIS team, having enough capacity, having enough resources to be able to deploy the solutions across board because the track for HIV shouldn't be different from the tracker for malaria. So that central way of managing the implementations and the solutions is really key to sort of saving costs across countries. May I add on this one? Uh, one thing that we need to, uh, uh, to look at is the health system thinking approach need to be applied in the country levels. Because when we talk about the district health information system models, this is a part of the uh, one uh, core pillars of the health system. So how it will be integrated. And uh, if we have very clear design uh, in the health system the thinking approach, I think at a saving cost, it will be uh, there. So this is something that we need to explore more, how will we work with the other uh, pillars of the health system. I think this is something that I need to add on. So we have a question from uh, Kala over here. Yeah, um, I have a fundamental question actually to all five of you. What was obvious to me when you talked was that you have all the last 10, 15, 20 years adopted an iterative evolutionary approach to your health information systems. And I've been involved a long time, and I remember the days when people thought that they could leapfrog over all the problems and immediately implement a kind of cradle to grave 
electronic medical record system, right? We would have all our data at the fingertips, every all the statistical data could be extracted from patient data, etc. Now, after a series of spectacular failures, that faded into the background, and one started a gradual approach. And South Africa is a good example. Uh, and Bolelo mentioned that we are at 77% now, but that's for the daily capture, right? We reached 100% in 2004 with monthly data capture. Then six, seven years ago, we started implementing daily capture, and we're still only at 77%. But it's a safe approach because your patients are not utterly dependent on that data. So nobody is dying if uh, you know you don't have connectivity in that. My question then is, it's clear now that electronic medical record systems are again, you know, being pushed strongly, both from countries, from leaderships, and from various global entities. So my question to you is, what is your timeline now? Because you definitely have some kind of a timeline for implementing fully fledged electronic medical record systems where hospitals and primary health care facilities and other stakeholders are all, you know, interconnected. What is your timeline for that? When are you going to start implementing it? And how long time do you expect it will take before you have that super system in place? Thank you. Okay, great, great question. So, uh, when you talk of timelines, I would say in Ghana, something has started already because in the past few years, uh, the ministry have had a, an e-health uh, policy that has translated into uh, implementation of a national EMR that uh, we've currently started some deployment, uh, starting with the uh, teaching hospitals and then the regional hospitals. What we are doing is to be able to integrate that with the national HMIS that is on the DS2 platform. I do know some uh, test uh, integrations have been successful. And so once uh, we are able to roll this out for all the hospitals in the country, it would give us a very good basis to translate and get our data from the clinical perspective into the national HMI restoration. It may not come very quickly, but uh, we have started and we hope we are able to go through it a lot more successfully. Thank you. Okay, thank you for the question. In Cameroon, we have timeline for the implementation of electronic registers not EMA. The day uh, GAH2 will have that uh, feature, we'll plan it. Uh, from Timor-Leste, we have the uh, local uh, uh, system that developed by uh, uh, Minister of Health. Uh, this is uh, uh, about uh, medical uh, electronic uh, uh, records. And now we are trying to work with the uh, uh, health information system, how it should be linked to the uh, uh, this, that system. So if you ask that, uh, what is the timelines? Uh, uh, we are still in developing our roadmap and our expectation will be 20, uh, 2025 will be uh, the deadline that uh, timeline that we will expect that to integrate it, all the electronic uh, uh, medical record into the uh, uh, health information system. Thank you. Uh, thanks, Carl. I think you always want to throw this uh, tough one. But I think with South Africa, we I think we have learned our lessons and we, there is no intention to go for a super electronic medical record right now. But do I think what we have learned for from COVID-19 uh, response it has showed us that it is uh, possible to uh, build linkages between various uh, systems and to be able then to, to really, within a very short space of time, be able to have a national uh, reporting from, from various existing systems. So I think a lot of efforts therefore that are being uh, 
uh, exploited right now is to build the, the various linkages. We have already successfully built linkages between the laboratory systems in South Africa, both uh, the National Health Laboratory Services, the private healthcare laboratory systems, and you are able to, to report uh, case level data on a daily basis. And I think those are some of the then uh, experiences and lessons that I think we are building upon. Thank you. Oh, we have to, <laughs> to say something, all of us. Okay, good. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay, in Rwanda, thank you. It's a good question. Actually, in Rwanda, we started long ago implementing the electronic medical record, uh, but um, it required much investment in terms of um, development, um, interconnection in the health facilities and sustain sustaining the system. So the initial development we did was not really, we didn't follow the process, the required process. Then uh, there was a stage that we reached, then clinicians were not really user-friendly. So we had to go back again into the process to ensure that we include clinicians. So currently we are revamping the system. We have at least uh, most of the hospitals they are using like three modules, which is registration, OPD and others. But now we are really developing the comprehensive EMR to ensure that all health facilities will be having it. So in terms of timeline, I think this is something that we could just discuss. Uh, uh, it said it, it has more details because it has different phases. But again, uh, it's a good question for us to really think on. So the future plan in our digitalization uh, another thing that have been done is that uh, they, they mean, uh, we have managed to, to bring all digitalization team into one directorate where I belong to have that coordination to ensure that there's no, again, scattered efforts around EMR. So that is why I was, like me, I was in HMIS. I was pulled there from HMIS. Now we are overrolling all the digitalization implementation in the ministry, the health sector, by the way. So thank you. There we are. Thank you so much. Uh, I think, first of all, big thanks to the five uh, panelists. And then, uh, of course, as I mentioned in the very first presentation here, we have many more countries and ministries represented. We didn't have space for all of you on the stage, but can you please stand up and then we give you all a big praise? Well, yeah. <laughs> you work in the ministry, Arthur. <laughs> we only had half an hour for questions, but now you know their faces. Uh, we have many breaks and we have a big social event tomorrow. So please take the opportunity this week to talk to them and ask more questions. Uh, we have a coffee break now and we'll start 10.30 with another very interesting uh, presentation. So enjoy your coffee and, and start talking to these guys. Thank you so much. Thank you very much.